Trump's complaint about the uh, intermediate uh, missile treaty is that Russia has been violating it. And I have Mm -hmm. to admit that I am very used to, well, just basically disregarding what Trump says about things. (laughs) Um, And but I've been reading that actually this isn't entirely not true, that Russia actually has been stepping outside the bounds of this treaty. And also. You, as you suggested earlier, that Russia was not as receptive as they might have been to President Obama's uh, push to rid the world of these weapons and reduce arsenals, which is really in contrast to uh, Putin's public uh, branding. If you watch interviews with him, one of his complaints about the United States that I've seen is actually a lack of commitment to things like arms control. So he certainly Mm -hmm. tried to position that he's sober and serious about these weapons um and maybe he's another person that we should be used to disregarding what he says as well what's the actual truth of russia and their relation to this treaty and then you know is the answer is that a viable play of well they're stepping out of it so we'll just scrap the thing yeah so let me just uh, let's, let's unravel this so the, the Intermediate Nuclear Forces Treaty, the INF Treaty, uh, John Bolton and has announced that they want to pull out of this. And Trump then made that statement in one of his political rallies a few weeks ago. Uh, if that, we only have two remaining arms, nuclear arms treaties with the, with the Russians. One is this, the INF, and the other is the START Treaty. The START Treaty expires in 2021, and Bolton wants to kill that. So this is what's at stake. If you let that, the, the, the INF treaty, he stabbed in the back. The, INF, the, the new START treaty, he wants to kill in its sleep, just not do anything and let it expire peacefully. You do that, then there's no more restraints. There's no more limits. There's no more inspections. One of the things that treaties give you is the ability to put your inspectors into their weapons sites so you can see what they're doing. That's why the military supports these kinds of agreements. It gives them transparency. It gives them predictability. It lets them plan more accurately. So there's general military support for these arms control agreements. Historically, it's been, it's been that way. It's been the ideologues who haven't liked them, not, not really the military. So will Putin go along with this? Well, you know, coming up very soon, November 11th, Putin and Trump are going to meet in Paris, and it's possible that Putin can pitch Trump to extend this treaty, can go over the head of Bolton, get right to the president, and might convince him to extend the treaty. Uh, Trump might be willing to do this. You You can disagree with Trump on nine out of ten things. Every once in a while, he is right. And Mm -hmm. if you can get him to do this, that would be a good thing. Are the Russians actually violating the INF? And again, uh, Trump is right. Yes, they are. I was on the International Security Advisory Board for the Secretaries of State, Clinton and Kerry, and I saw the intel on this when it was coming in in 2014. And it's pretty clear they are violating. It's 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 a relatively small violation. It's not militarily significant. They've taken one of their short-range cruise missiles, one of the ones they launched from the ground, so a ground-launched cruise missile, and they've modified it so that it could have a greater range, a range that falls within the range prohibited by the treaty. So they are violating the treaty, and they deployed this at a test site in Russia and one other site, in, but in the Russian part of Europe, and it's, it's just banned. You can't do it. You can't have a missile like this. Does it matter? Uh, not really. Uh, they, the Russians have lots of other ways they can hit European targets, and we have lots of other ways that we can hit those targets with nuclear weapons. But it is technically a, a violation. Does Putin want to give up his nuclear weapons? No, I don't, I don't think he does. This, this is one of the last vestiges of superpower status that he has. Mm-hmm. So at this point, we're talking about getting these two um, autocratic leaders somewhat irresponsible leaders, certainly undemocratic leaders, to just agree to the limits. Let's preserve the limitation and inspection regime so that we might have a shot at at going back to reductions when we have more reasonable leaders in both countries. So when we talk about a figure like John Bolton and this sort of broader neoconservative and far-right 
opposition to these treaties. I mean, there, there's two components of it. They're both disturbing, but I think, and connected, but they are somewhat distinct. So one, I guess I understand just from that perspective, ideologically, is just an opposition to any agreement to a restraint on U.S. force, period, as uh, a principle exactly of U.S. That's exactly right. Okay, go ahead. No, 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 that's yeah. exactly right. You continue this. The idea is that, you know, we're the good guys, and we have hegemony over the world. We're the superpower. You know, who would you want to be the superpower? Uh, China? Mm-hmm. France? Mm-hmm. You know, we're, we're the good guys, so we should have a certain amount of American exceptionalism. The rules shouldn't apply to us. We should be able to have the freedom to exercise our military force wherever we want, because we will only do that for good. And what we want is restraints on other people. And the liberals think that you get those restraints by mutual restraints, by treaties that that mutually restrict both sides' military force. And the neoconservatives or the conservatives say, no, you only get those kinds of restrictions by force, by military dominance. And it has that 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 view is particularly virulent and particularly sort of nationalistic right now in in this administration. It really is, you know, America uba alles. It's really above all. We set the rules, and if if you don't if you don't go along with us, we will crush you one way or the other. You see that in the way they're treating Iran. You see that in the way they're trying to approach North Korea. You see it in in their view of all international mechanisms, starting with the United Nations. Definitely, and I, I want to touch on Iran and North Korea in a second. But the other thing that is incredibly disturbing, and obviously I, you know, entirely I reject every single piece of that view ideologically. But the other part that you read about and hear about is also the notion of developing, as you said earlier, battlefield deployable or smaller uh, you know, nuclear weapons. How does that fit into it? And is this actually a legitimate thought process amongst these people that these things can be deployed in a more narrow way? Is this something they're really yeah. working on and want? Yes, it is. And it comes directly from this view that, look, we have this military weapon. Why are we self-deterred from using it? Why, why, do we, why do we hesitate to use nuclear weapons? Um, and, and part of the reasoning is, according to this view, is that they're too big. You know, we now have bombs. Our, our basic bomb is approximately uh, 10 times to 30 times the size of the Hiroshima bomb. So we no longer have atomic bombs. That's Hiroshima and Nagasaki. We have hydrogen bombs that basically duplicate the basic energy force in the universe, what powers the sun, fusion of atoms, not splitting of atoms. And those bombs, you know, are city destroyers. And so therefore, the logic goes, we need to make smaller bombs with back to Hiroshima size or smaller so that we can use them on the battlefield and we can have an advantage. Um, and, and we can control the escalation. So if you go to the recent issue of Foreign Affairs, for example, the, the, one of the preeminent American journals, you will see a discussion of nuclear weapons, and it's led off by an article that says we shouldn't be afraid of nuclear weapons anymore. And it's, 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 this, it's presented as new thinking by some of the new breed of young Dr. Strangeloves that have emerged in this town. Right, right, no, really, right, they are out right. there, and that you know them, and that's what they think. Yeah. You know, El, El, Elbridge Colby at the Center for New American Security or, or Keir Lieber at Georgetown University, they're, they're, they're out there. And what they're doing is recycling theories from the 1950s. This is what military leaders thought, and conservatives thought in the 1950s. Nuclear weapons are the weapons of the future. We need them for every mission. So we built not just nuclear missiles, not just nuclear bombs, but nuclear torpedoes, nuclear depth charges, nuclear landmines. We, my favorite weapon was a nuclear bazooka. We called it the Davy Crockett. It fire, fire, fired a very small nuclear warhead about a half a mile. Now, why anyone would want to fire a nuclear weapon half a mile is beyond me. You know, and even the Army figured that out. We stopped making them in the 1960s. But we went nuclear nuts in the 50s, and we basically, we don't have those weapons anymore. We got rid of them, and the Russians got rid of them. And you know, now you have a new class of these, as I say, young Dr. Strangeloves who want to bring them back and want to put them on ships and want to put them ground launch cruise missiles, want, want new artillery pieces again. We used to have nuclear artillery. And they're presenting this as just, part of the new great power struggle and this is a weapon we should have it is it was insane in the 50s it's insane now i have to say just the brief uh 
editorial here, the, the parallels across every single part of public discourse of ideas, right-wing ideas from the 50s and 60s getting recycled as fresh thinking now is it's amazing it's everything from like <laughs> gender relationships to nukes yes it's kind of yeah, to the john birch society to the john to, right. to american nazis right I mean, these kinds of ideas that america flirted with and rejected well they never went away right and now they're back and they're all being supported by this well i guess to be honest this kind of white nationalist view right. that cuts across all the issues at areas and this is how it's being expressed in the nuclear realm it is not apart from the the white nationalism it it, it, it is grounded in that worldview now I, i'm not saying that the people who are are proposing this would identify themselves as white nationalists. I'm not saying that at all, but I'm saying this is the same thinking. This is its ideological root. This is they have a shared worldview and they have a shared aim, which is U.S. and what they generally mean by that is white U.S. global domination. Well, we could paraphrase Andrew Gillum's right. <laughs> Uh, I'm not saying you do, but they think you are, right? Oh, uh, right. I think that all right. I'm not saying it. you're a racist, yeah. but they think you're right. a racist. There you go. Yeah, well, it, same I, thing I, works. I, 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 right. I, you know, I haven't heard this. Con this is the first time I think I've discussed it like this, and the first time I haven't heard anybody else discussing like this. But, but I, I believe that this is true. I believe that's what's happening. And I, I don't believe you would be seeing these ideas giving this much prominence were it not for, for Donald Trump and Trumpism and the nationalist impulse it's writing.